Good evening and thank you for joining us at the Los Angeles Adventurers Club tonight. Uh, my name is Grant McComb, member 1231, and uh, we have a very special guest who's truly embodied uh, the spirit of adventure professionally and personally, uh, Mr. John Norris. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Grant, and, thanks, uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for, thanks for having me, man. It's really good to be here. Heard a lot about your club. Never been here until tonight to see this amazing facility and some great men and women here, and uh, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you again for coming. Uh, we're excited to hear the talk, and uh, I hear you're just wrapping up production on a documentary. Yeah, we're um, the Call Sign Trailblazer documentary we filmed <clears throat> started in February in Montana and finished physical production July, or uh, actually the end of August. And now we're in post-production right now, editing, mixing, and all of that, the arduous work. But um, we're about a third of the way through the edit, and it's a kind of a constant weekly process that I'm working with the producers on coming along nicely. But it will hit on the subjects we're going to talk about tonight related to Hidden War, um, what a game warden is. It gets back into the history of conservation. We go further than just cartel cannabis, other threats in this country that have eroded, you know, kind of the conservation model to kind of keep our country intact and keep our wildlife resources intact for next uh, future generations to enjoy, obviously, and keep us safe in our homeland, which is our biggest concern over everything else. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, a little bird tells me you have uh, some footage for us. We do. We're going to play a three-minute video right now that's basically a teaser that we used for the first edition of Hidden War that we have here tonight. Uh, this is taken from the NRA's Life of Duty Patriot Profile series that my good friend Rick Stewart from American Zealot Productions is a, a great producer on. It kind of embodies mo a lot of what we're going to talk about, but very tightly and succinctly on what our special operations unit and game wardens called the Marijuana Enforcement Team were built to fight here in California, but this is a template not only going on in California, but in every other state of the union from these drug cartels, these human trafficking cartels. Uh, we're looking at, you know, fentanyl pills being made in dirty labs that look like Skittles, colored candy actually to attract young kids to ingest these poisonous pills. These are the same cartels that are still growing toxically tainted cannabis on private land in the you know, obvious over outdoors. They're still in the national forests. They're still on public land to a lesser extent now. Um, we've seen definitely an increase and we've incentivized the cartels through Prop 64 and regulation in California, unfortunately. Um, it's not that we regulated, it's that we've regulated poorly and we've increased the problem. So the challenges have never been greater for my old colleagues from the Cannabis Enforcement Program in the Department of Fish and Wildlife and any other agency official trying to deal with this problem and keep the public safe and keep our wildlife species intact. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see the footage and I can't wait to see the documentary. All right, let's roll it. Anybody in America that would go into one of these sites, if they could see what we see on the team daily, it's gut-wrenching. In the middle of California's most pristine public land, during one of the state's worst droughts, pipes snake through the streams, siphoning large amounts of the public's water to grow weed. Nine times out of ten, they're cartel or drug trafficking organizations out of Mexico. He says the cartels have carved up the public's land for themselves. We have a rifle on the ground. That's a good word. Suspects on the run. specializes in apprehension, stealth, and stalking tactics.
there's obviously an element of danger to this job, and we've had a lot of close calls. We always go into each mission with the mindset that this one can turn deadly any minute. I came around this brush thicket, and I see the front muzzle of an AR-15, and I went, oh great. As I was drawing my gun out, the dog, I just saw her come off from the right through the manzanita and just nail this guy and literally tackled him to the ground. My dog Phoebe's had about 114 bites. I jokingly <laughs> refer to it as a fur missile. Phoebe's are good everywhere. It's not only the armed grower with the AK-47, it's booby traps, punji pits, just waiting for us on trails. They have no idea what these guys are spraying on those plants. If you're Dan on their, uh, their next joint there, it might be their last one. They're mice and I'm a cat and my job is to chase mice and I'm gonna chase mice until I'm dead. We've taken hundreds of them into custody that didn't wanna give up. If I was a bad guy out there doing what they're doing now, I'd be worried because uh, we're good. This is the United States of America. This is our land and whoever's out here doing this is gonna have to get caught. Still gets me fired up. Watch wow, it's yeah. getting me fired yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, um, the, lot, lot of lot of memories from operational footage, you know, from missions and training and <clears throat> the sound bites. And that was 2016. That was when we were about three years, you know, into building up a unit and, and kind of getting what we call a battle rhythm, kind of a good cadence where everybody was clicking. Uh, it was a historical team. The department had never had anything like that. No conservation game warden you know, agency really had a dedicated team strictly to fight that problem. Um, so it was, real, it was a beautiful challenge, a beautiful opportunity. And obviously, you can tell from the energy in the video that there's some camaraderie and there's some trust and just a brotherhood. You know, uh, guys just love each other, selfless. Um, I never worked with better people you know, in my career than, than working through those issues. Um, and now they're still doing a great, great job out there fighting an uphill battle as they continue to play whack-a-mole with more and more of these problems now on the private land side as well as the public land. But um, yeah, it brings back some memories. Always good stuff. That's incredible. I mean, it skews more action movie than documentary. And, yeah. you know, as someone who at least until a couple of years ago was relatively uninitiated into the life of a game warden, right. you know, you think, you know, checking uh, fishing licenses and hunting tags and, and, you know, lining up paperwork. You don't think SEAL Team 6 over here. You, <laughs> know, you don't think, uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground, uh, yeah. you know, direct enforcement. So I'd love to hear more about your experience with that. Because I think a lot of people don't realize the day-to-day -day reality of a game warden looks more like this than, you know, uh, an REI hiker. Yeah, it's, the definition of a game warden is it's really misperceived publicly, and certainly the definition and really the challenges and the tasks we're responsible for with threats on our environment um, have definitely changed, you know, in the last 50 years, especially in the last 10, 15, with things like this. I mean, ultimately... When we started getting involved in these cartel grow raids and we were getting in gunfights with armed cartel gunmen in the Silicon Valley foothills in 2005 when my partner Game Warden on his very first raid, and this is you know seven, eight years before we had a tactical unit specifically in our own agency, working with the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, our brothers from, from that unit, I mean, here we are in eyesight of Facebook and Instagram and Google and the tech capital of the world where I grew up with great cell coverage and bad radio coverage and getting ambushed by cartel growers that have been in this part of a very densely wooded, but not far from civilization, open space public land. And we knew right then, not only were these guys some of the most dangerous criminals in the forest for any of our hunters, hikers, outdoor enthusiasts, anybody who likes to recreate in the outdoors, but they were some of the biggest wildlife destroyers. We didn't know yet about the EPA banned poisons like carbofuran, metafos, the stuff that was banned in the US over 30 years ago now because the nerve agent, the anticoagulant is such a deadly toxin, we can't even use it on legitimate agriculture in America. EPA deemed it very unsafe to do so, but this stuff is imported from south of the border. Mm -hmm. The cartels, other third world criminal organizations will use it because it will keep everything off a plant, but it will kill everything that comes within you know, a couple feet of that plant if they ingest this stuff, humans included, you could die. 
I mean, it's, it's that nasty. So these are the biggest environmental criminals or some of the biggest that we were seeing in California for the first time because game wardens were never involved in a drug raid on cannabis. It's just not what people perceived or thought we should do. But the bottom line, Grant, is we're sworn to uphold and protect not only our public safety, like all law enforcement from any department, police, California Highway Patrol, federal agents. We're sworn to do all that and trained to do all that federally and at the state level, but our forte and our focus is environmental protection, clean water, wildlife habitat, and protecting wildlife and making sure they're managed legally and ethically through legal hunting, which does help wildlife populations as we know through the conservation model. This isn't conservation. This is absolute disregard for any of our wildlife resources in America, a lack of humanity or, com or concern for human health and safety. These guys just want to make money and they're more than, more than complicit in wanting to poison you with either toxically tainted cannabis that you're ingesting, thinking it's a pure product, um, fentanyl, methamphetamine, human sex trafficking, all the same organization embedded within America and operating with impunity right now, multi-billion dollar business. And this is what we stumbled on just from the environmental crime standpoint, but it goes, like I just described, so much further as an American threat. Wow. And it's one that people don't generally think about. Right. You know, especially when you say the cartel, you, you know, you yeah. think um, a litany of things before you think environmental right. crime. Right. So being the boots on the ground, really dealing with these individuals in a way that not many other you know, people, uh, let alone law enforcement agencies, get to. I'm sure you have a litany of, of uh, uh, stories that you could tell about these day to day interactions with uh, people growing in the woods or people, um, you know, running different things through uh, these lands that you're trying to protect. And I'd love to know. Um, What's one of them that stands out to you? And maybe something that you really haven't touched on in, in too much detail, if that's not too big of an ask. No, it's, it, it's a good ask. And I think, I think the thing that really strikes out to me, and, and it just triggered, um, uh, your question is a great one, because it just triggered, we're in the editing process of Call Sign Trailblazer, and there's a section on the patron saints. Mm. And the worship of the patron saints, and we dissect that a little bit, and getting into the mindset of this type of poacher. I mean, in a traditional game warden contact, if I'm you know, contacting guys, say, spotlighting deer at night illegally, they've got loaded guns, maybe they're drunk, maybe they've got some cannabis, um, they're taking illegal animals. Nine times out of 10, they're not out there with the intent of wanting to harm people intentionally. They're not out there with the intent where the second they get caught, they're necessarily gonna go to guns and they're gonna, they're gonna fight you to the death because they have a multi-million dollar product that they could lose, they could also lose status in the organization. Um, and it's really the mindset of this particular criminal in all the different factions of the crimes I just mentioned besides tainted weed. And it's um, when you're praying to deities that will give you the power to be invisible and sanction your behavior as legitimate corporate enterprise within a cartel organization and law enforcement and the public that are out in the forest, the hiker, the hunter, the equestrian enthusiast, the fisherman that might stumble upon one of these growth sites is an enemy. And they are deemed to be taken out so that you don't compromise their legitimate business practice. Um, cartel patron saint is kind of a worship se uh, section out of uh, a, a culture of chaos. Obviously, there's a lot of chaos in Mexico. It's third world. There's a lot of challenges. We understand that. And we're not disparaging any religion in this conversation. We're not saying good, bad, or indifferent. We're just identifying the mindset of another religion. Um, we've seen that level of determination in so many grows I've been in when I've seen the look in the eyes of some of these growers, guys that don't want to give up. That thousand meter stare you hear from military veterans that you know have been around conflict, they've been around violence, either uh, gun violence, knife violence, um, physical violence, whatever the case may be. And we saw and continue to see, my partners do, still doing these missions you know, throughout the year. We saw and see a constant example of that in these growth sites. Um, a lot of fist fights, um, a lot of guys that don't want to give up guns. Uh, obviously, we've you know, had gun fights we could not avoid getting into. There were six that we as a team had been involved in collectively, either ourselves or with other team members. Um, when I retired in 2017. And in Hidden War, the first edition, we go into that last gunfight, that officer involved shooting, that was on the Sierra Azul property over in Santa Cruz County after Prop 64 had been passed for just about a year. And the outdoor cartels, knowing they weren't gonna get a lot of pressure on them because most law enforcement teams now were gonna start checking regulated growers, mom and pop small operations in plain view, look for compliance. And a lot of agencies said when we made 
outdoor trespass, i.e. cartel cannabis production or growing out in the woods, a misdemeanor mm. and, and watered it down from a felony. And if you're a juvenile grower or your juvenile cartel apprentice, which they have a lot of the younger guys up with them mm. learning, it's an infraction. When that happened, a ton of agencies outside of us and a handful of, a very small handful of others said, we're not gonna go after these guys. Yeah. No one's, it's, I mean, cannabis is legal now. They've made it a misdemeanor, they've made it an infraction. Who's gonna prosecute a guy for this problem? You know, what they're not looking at is the EP ban toxics, the punji pits and traps, and uh, we've got some pictures that are gonna rotate up here. You'll see a punji pit right there. That punji pit was found in Whiskey Town National Park in Shasta County in 2017 by Brian Boyd and K9 Phoebe, who you saw highlighted um, in that video we just showed. This is one of about eight punji pits we've seen statewide since then, covered up with a tarp, looks like a trail, and you know most of us know that have relatives that fought in the Vietnam War know what the Viet Cong did. Oh, yeah. It's their tactic. Mm. Now, not all grows from the cartels are this violent, but that's an anti-personnel trap. There's no other intent for that. And this wasn't even in the grow site. This was on a highly used public trail, so anybody walking on that trail it happened to be our law enforcement team that day, but it could have been a group of kids hiking in the National Forest, right? They step in, they shear their legs, cuts up their feet, their ankles. Um, what the Viet Cong used to do is put human excrement mm -hmm. on the tips of the, of the bamboo, like, uh, like I'm hearing it, right? You guys know this story. Well, what these guys are doing is they're taking the EPA banned toxic poison, carbofuran huh. metaphos, which is a nerve agent, highly deadly, put it on the tips of the sticks because they know what's that gonna do when that gets into your bloodstream from a direct cut. Probably gonna be far more deadly quicker than even human excrement for the bacteria issue. So when we start seeing that stuff on a California National Park Trail, that tells you the mindset of these guys. And that's the difference between your traditional poacher that's out there uh, violating the law, maybe he's a chronic wildlife destroyer, but if you catch him nine times out of 10, he's gonna give up, he's not gonna wanna fight you, he doesn't wanna make it any more of a problem, he doesn't wanna go to jail for felonies and lose his truck and lose his guns and lose everything, but he knows he's gonna take a hard penalty on misdemeanors, this is a whole different element. You know, Now we're fighting what a lot of people are saying is uh, a, a domestic eco-terrorist work, working within borders in America when we talk about the cartels. And regardless of how you define it, it's a pervasive problem. Um, we talk about what's happened since book one dropped right when I retired. Uh, I think it dropped in May of 2019, April of 2019 actually, and I retired operationally at the very end of 2018. Well, three and a half years have gone by since that, and I could have never predicted this, and I don't think any of us can here in the room tonight, that we would shut the world down for a year point five or more on a global pandemic under COVID-19. And when that happened, what do the cartels and organized crime groups like this do that are in America and other countries? They just go, oh yeah, Disneyland's open and there's no lightning passes needed. Everything's free today. Hmm. I'm just gonna go crazy because they know law enforcement assets are tied up. The first six months of COVID, game wardens, police officers, federal agents, what were we doing? We, didn't, we weren't making contacts because nobody knew exactly how deadly this virus was going to be. Um, we were shut down from going out and actually pursuing and doing grow raids. Um, wardens and rangers and law enforcement weren't even getting together physically and meeting. Everything was remote on Zoom meetings for the longest time, especially, you know, cut off remote uh, conservation back country type operators like game wardens are. So I'm hearing stories from my old teammates of how groves are popping up everywhere. You know, mm. all our MET members are scouting their individual parts of the state and finding cartel guys just going crazy with outdoor groves and they're not getting raided. Um, cartels know that. Wow and they played to the uh, culture of chaos, which they thrive in. We don't thrive so well in chaos because we're so blessed and lucky in very, very um, resource rich and opportunity rich America, and we're so blessed that we are. But this was a perfect environment, a basically a, a breeding ground for just off the charts crime. In every area we talked about, the outdoor cannabis issue that we fight, fentanyl, meth, human trafficking, human trafficking exploded. Uh, and now we're three years you know, after book one and what's happening now, and we look at the trends of this not going away, we're certainly seeing more of it on private land as opposed to the public land and the outdoors and the forests. But we had significant grows just this last year in 2022 in our national forests with the booby traps, with the carbofuran, guys with AKs and AR-15s, uh, our dogs engaging these suspects before they could shoot and us not having to get in a gunfight, thankfully. Um, it hasn't slowed down because again, all these things have just kind of fed into uh, really a, um, an incentivizing climate. And we gotta look at border protection right now. 
obviously the border has changed completely since the new administration's been uh, you know, in our country for the last two years. And right now the cartels know that and they're capitalizing on that. And for more operatives to get in for trafficking and all those other crimes, um, it's really gotten so much easier, obviously, mm -hmm. with the lack of border control that we truly have. And that's made it much more of a threat for us as Americans throughout our country Rather, we're in plain sight here in downtown L.A. when, uh, you know, a fentanyl pr uh, deal or production can be going down. Human trafficking is in every state. Cartel cannabis is in about 25 to 27 out of the 50 states. And right now it's not slowing down because of that. And we just as Americans need to know that. So we make the best decisions we can when it comes to what are we going to do next nationally? Um, what are we going to do as game wardens, as law enforcement officers, as adventurers, outdoor Indoor, uh, the LA Adventuring Club. This group stands for so many good things America was built on, right? Our outdoor resources are where so much of our, our adventure comes and where we derive our spirituality and where we find our, we get reset. You know, we find common ground. We find less anxiety. We find strength. We find confidence in our outdoor environments and being around fellow, uh, you know, outdoor enthusiasts and adventurers, that's the spice of life. And anyone that's going to come into our country and threaten that. I think is public enemy number one because it's happening right in our backyard. And what's that doing down the road of people that just aren't going to have that opportunity and they're going to have some threats that they might encounter because of, because of uh, what, what we're facing right now. Definitely. And you br bring up a number of great points and I'm trying to parse out exactly where <laughs> to go with this. I mean, that was a you know, amazing uh, uh, couple of minutes here. Uh, I think the next question I actually touched on this briefly. Uh, one of the points that uh, the proponents of legalization in California mm -hmm. brought up was that it would eliminate crime. It would right. uh, bring down the instances of legal grow operations, of dealing, of cartel violence. And it sounds like the opposite has happened, especially yeah. uh, with COVID, especially with you know different kind of dynamics in the state and the rest of the country. So, I mean, if you want to go into that a little deeper, I think that's you know, a good jumping off point. Yeah, that, that's a real accurate assessment. Um, we knew regulation was coming when we were forming up MET in the pilot program in 2013. We didn't know exactly when. 2016 was kind of the big push when Prop 64 was, was, uh, was you know, voted in. And we were told by so many other agencies and so many people within our own agency, it's like, yeah, you guys just built up, you know, the the super team, the, 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 you know, special forces tactical unit, you guys are going to be out of a job in two or three years because this stuff's going to be on the I-5 growing like citrus trees. It's going to be regulated. <laughs> There's not going to be any black market. The cartels are going to look elsewhere. And we went, I just kind of, you know, smirked and grinned and kind of stayed quiet and went, let's see how that all goes. Yep. And something I did, one of my jobs as a team leader of the MET team was outreach and education. And this was before we were on gag orders where we couldn't do you know, certain sanctioned press with administration blessings, whether it was investigative news stories with Fox, NBC, ABC, CNN, Dan Rather. We did all those stories. We did the documentary we just saw a clip of to really tell honestly the story going on out there, not really apolitical. Just talk about what's going on out there and let the public make a choice on what, the, what, you know, what bill of goods are they being sold. Um, and when I saw the language of, of Prop 64, I had probably done 100 PowerPoint presentations and personal experience presentations to lobby groups, uh, you know, the governor's people, cannabis grower groups for the first time, and showing them this problem. And legitimate cannabis farmers that are trying to get legal, they're trying to come out and regulate right when we get off the ground in 2016 to do it by the numbers. And they're as outraged and horrified by some of these pictures we're showing tonight in more depth that this is going on out there. They weren't even aware. Um, and when I asked everybody that had any type of political influence, I said, look, if we're going to regulate, we know it's coming. Just regulate smart. Reward a good cannabis grower that's conserving water, that's doing everything by the numbers, that they're not putting any uh, inorganics or any, anything remotely toxic on the plants. But this outdoor thing with the cartels that are making hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on a black market cannabis trade, if you water this down and don't keep a felony on it and, and don't look at it on a marijuana standpoint, Look at it on public safety crime and environmental destruction crime and go after them for that. And when it became a misdemeanor, after all that work we had done, I knew we were in for a nothing but a snowball. And it was going to roll right over us. And now we're exactly five years later. 
And I just co-hosted and helped out Jorge Ventura and Sonic Basu on The Daily Caller with a second documentary they did called Narcofornia. Spent a week in Siskiyou County with them, immersed and did a bunch of interviews with Jorge, and then immersed with Siskiyou County sheriffs and did raids on the last day of five that we were up there. And I'm still around doing a lot of this work and working with teams and building up new teams that are, that are, that are dealing with this cartel cannabis problem. But it was mind-blowing to me to jump back in on a private land grow that I had been at it for three and a half, four years since retirement and see what a massive devastation train wreck it was up in Siskiyou County and how not only the Mexican cartels, but new groups like the Asia, the Chinese and the Hmong cartels coming out of the Midwest have literally almost taken over Siskiyou County as one example because of how Prop 64 is structured, knowing they're gonna get very little, if any pressure from law enforcement and they're only gonna get a misdemeanor charge whether they have seven plants or 7,000, the most they're gonna do is lose their plants in one grow house, and they could own 100 others. And this stuff is all being transported back east. It's being sold all over the black market in the nation. Nothing's stopping transportation. Their distribution centers are great. They're still making a bunch of money. While legal growers, trying to do it by the numbers, while well, the oversight, the taxes, the inspections, and the money they're putting up to make toxically pure cannabis, get it on a market properly, they're going under these multi-million dollar farms and actually would not recommend new growers to come in under Prop 64 and regulate. They'd say stay in the black market or just get out of the trade entirely. Wow. So we failed. There's no other way to you know, say it. And so to your point, we thought, and everybody thought, most, most of Californians thought, the way Prop 64 was built and packaged and sold is there's gonna be money for education and agencies to you know, fight this in a more, uh, you know, more effective way. Um, we're gonna eliminate crime, we're gonna stop the cartels, we're gonna do all this and have purity in the market, and none of that has happened, sadly. Yeah, it sounds like there's still a, a massive need for enforcement. Yeah. It seems like there's a massive need on the environmental side and on uh, the criminal side aside from right. marijuana. Right. Um, now you had a hand in building these teams before you um, retired in 2017. Right. What were you looking for in the individuals you brought on to these teams? I know there's one guy who was at Special Forces. I yeah. think you uh, discussed that in the book a little bit. Yeah, um, the, we, it was, uh, I think you, you and I talked a little bit of, uh, before, before right now on, on the interview. Um, it was kind of the perfect storm. You know, everything was about timing. And to build a team of this nature under the political climate of California at the time um, really took a, a, a leap of faith on the part of really good leadership you know, having a great chief of patrol that trusted us, that believed in us, that I'd known my, and respected and admired my whole career. Um, having good guys that were already embedded, they either had uh, like Navy SEAL Special Forces experience, one of our uh, prime operators, and if we weren't involved as military special operators before we were game wardens, we had done domestic law enforcement on a special operations front, or had been brought into special operations teams, rather as snipers, sniper instructors, different things, so there had been a lot of us on the game warden front, building these skill sets, integrating in with tactical units from all over the state of California. And there's some amazing ones in this state, full-time teams, uh, all the Bay Area teams that I've been, you know, mentored around and worked with. At Los Angeles down here, some of the best SWAT teams in the, on the, in the world, um, Sacramento. So we had a lot of resources. We had just enough people that had a lot of tactical experience within the agency and were also really good traditional game wardens. Um, obviously, when you're working this type of job, how intense it can be, how physically straining it can be, 100 degree days when you're doing raids, carrying 60 pounds of gear plus a rifle, trying to keep a dog cool, sneaking in on bad guys, 20 hour days sometimes. Um, you have to, you know, mental and physical fitness have to be at their prime, and you have to have just a motivated group of individuals to stay with it. And you're gonna see right here, we got a picture of uh, one of our new canines going down a cliff repelling, uh, doing some of our, you know, our mountaineering training because California being one of the most diverse, beautiful states, we got Mount Whitney at 14,000 feet and we're down at sea level some days doing a raid. And we've literally done raids up at 10, 11, 12,000 feet in wow. the Eastern Sierras and had to use these, you know, these type of skills and, and tactics just given the diversity of California. So we need very unique individuals that can keep that pace for years upon end on, on the Met front. So I look for that. I look for exceptional operators with exceptional careers that you would not even know they had an ego. You know, they had a real humble, a real selfless, a real team orientation. Um, team was gonna be first. They were never gonna be about themselves first. And you know, we all put it on the line. And a testament to all the guys that decided when I asked them, do you wanna be on the team? And I'm so 
happy and blessed that they said yes, because we didn't have a lot of people to choose from. And it's not a, it's not a dig on any game warden in my agency, it's just that we're all good at different things. You know, and the, the Met and the Cannabis Enforcement Program wardens aren't any more important than a patrol warden doing what we all did for the first five, 10, 15 years of, of our career. You know, there are so many threats to wildlife, and there's a picture of the team right there in 20, uh, 2018, not too long before I pulled the plug, and two of our really good dogs that will remain nameless right there. But yeah, not your typical look for a game warden, you know, night vision, multi-cams. I mean, are, is, is that, you know, our training site in Central California, or is that somewhere in Afghanistan? I mean, you could, you know, you could, you could put them either place. But the bottom line is that's what it got to because of the enemy we were fighting. And um, since we got the training, we got the support, and we got the dedicated commitment to this and not doing other things, we, knock on wood, haven't been hurt in a gunfight since. We've only had one other gunfight, and that was the one we had in 2017 when I was still a team leader. Um, the guys, because of skills, because of good judgment, because of canine assets, God bless our dogs. Man, our dogs are amazing. Um, we'll, we'll talk about, there it is. Phoebe brought up a great picture of Phoebe right there. That's uh, canine <laughs> Phoebe, and we're going to talk about her real quick. It's perfect timing because when we were able to bring these dogs, life just got safer for not only us, but also the growers. Um, Phoebe literally saved my life 20 times over again. Chapter 2 of, of Hidden War goes into specifically the 2012 mission that I had Brian and Phoebe down working with me in the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office in, 20, uh, in 2012 before the team was built. And we're into two arm growers, literally a stone's throw, three air miles from where I grew up in the Silicon Valley in the foothills near Uvis Reservoir. And there she is. That's the day of the mission right there. That's two, uh, Brian and another operator, uh, Captain Mark Imsdahl, um, helping out. Uh, and that was one of those oh crap missions. You know, I was Brian's canine support and we're going up against two guys and we got riflemen behind us and they're walking right at us. We're going to ambush them. We got the, you know, we got the element of surprise for once. They don't. And one guy starts to make a move toward a gun. We deploy the dog. The dog is on that suspect and gets him on the ground before he can do anything. And right when his partner turns around, we see another gun on his waistband, a big, big revolver, and he's going for it. And Brian's just telling me, John, take my dog. And he's going hand to hand with the number two guy. And I'm dealing with a dog that's got a grower under bite duress on the back right calf. This guy's groaning and stumbling around on the ground. And what I don't know at the time is he's pulling a Russian torque rod pistol from his waistband and trying to turn it to get it to me. And I'm running at full speed to get on this guy and contain him so he can't pull a weapon on not only me, but everybody behind me coming into support. And had Phoebe not had good bite duress on him, I'm having a gunfight from me to you, if not closer, me to your drinking glass. And you don't have to be a skilled marksman to make a shot doing that. So I'm probably taking lead and the riflemen running to keep up behind me are probably, you know, taking bullets as well. But she saved my life that day. Um, and she kept those guys from getting shot as well. So everybody went home. Now, there was obviously some wound damage from a, a bite like that, but everybody's alive. And that changed the game. And I made phone calls literally from that growth site within an hour of that incident to my current chief of patrol and the new chief of patrol that was gonna, gonna take the place. Nancy Foley was gonna shift to Mike Carey on both great leaders. And I said, chiefs, we need to have this dog or dogs like her on every mission we do if we're gonna try to apprehend these guys because it completely changes the game from safety. Um, it puts the advantage in our court and it's not safe to do it any other way. I came this close today. And that was the very end of grow season. And we were, the very next year, we were doing the pilot program that led to the Met team. That mission was kind of the, you know, that was the tipping point. The straw that kind of broke the proverbial camel's back um, to get us in there. And everybody that was on the Met or most of the guys were on that mission helping out. And the Sheriff's Department were just elated to see how good Phoebe was. And they ended up getting a dog with support from us and all these other agencies that do this type of work, we're starting to get dogs and train them to very specialized training for this mission that isn't really a full-blown military anti-Taliban mission, but it's not an LAPD urban police dog, you know, taking suspects down on pavement or going through buildings. Our dogs do that too, but any canine is just such a great asset in, in law enforcement and they are a four-legged partner. We, you know, we don't even consider them any different than anybody on the team. So. Um, Phoebe saved my life uh, countless times and hundreds of other officers. She had 116 apprehension bites in her career. 
Wow. And 900 arrests where she didn't have to bite. She found missing children. She found murder weapons. But most of her work was anti-cartel stuff. And she was every bit as friendly as my yellow lab that we just lost um, at 12 and a half years old. She retired with me. She was a, a companion canine um, in the agency, not doing any of this stuff. But she was as friendly as that dog would be and uh, never been an officer. So she was a one in a million dog. Um, and it, it's, it's very nostalgic and very emotional for me to talk about her and think about those missions and see pictures of her as I go through books and sign and give them to you guys. It's just so much overwhelming. Um, but that changed the game, and we all learned a lot from what that dog can do. And now they are a main staple in the cannabis enforcement program. Um, I'm working with state parks tactical units on this problem as well and other teams. Uh, and they're all about getting dogs and doing what we're doing because of the program. We kind of, you know, stumbled and failed and succeeded. And um, you look at, and that, that's Phoebe at our uh, California Capitol, really, in Sacramento, um, receiving a resolution award. Phoebe got her own from the assembly, and then Met and Phoebe got a resolution award from the Senate. The first time resolutions have been bestowed upon a game warden unit, which was quite an honor, but this was 2017, a year after Prop 64 passed, and our legislatures were in session in both houses, and we were making the rounds in formal uniforms with Phoebe, and as they're reading the award language, the most rewarding part about that award wasn't the award itself, it was the data and the numbers they were putting up of how many poison plants were still out there being eradicated under legal regulation? How many feet of black poly pipe diverting California's water by the millions to billions of gallons in the middle of the second largest state drought California's ever had? How many guns, how many you know, uh, hundreds of gallons of EPA banned poisons? And wait a minute, this was all supposed to go away. We just changed, we all you know, enacted this law. So there was a lot going on with that picture and what that dog stands for, um, standing tall outside the Capitol, you know, the great state of California, because, you know, one thing growing up here, and here I am, you know, at the LA Adventurers Club, and most of you guys are right here from LA, and I started my career down here, and I'll date myself, 92 to 95, it was Riverside County in LA a lot, down in San Diego doing stuff, and um, California's a beautiful state. We have so many good people, and we have amazing, for as populated as we are, we still have amazing wildlife resources. We have the eastern Sierras that are like no other place on Earth. We have the beaches. We have the coastal redwoods up north. Um, just amazing. And this problem and, and what's left to protect in, in California, the golden state, I consider truly golden and will always consider it home as well as my new state of Montana, is that there's so much left to protect here, yet there's so many things and so many policies and so much mindset right now currently that makes it an uphill battle. We're pushing a snowball up a hill, but we're not giving up. And hopefully with education and being able to talk to you guys on stuff like this and get the word out to your members, um, it, it will help change things so more and more people will know. Uh, we didn't name the second book Hidden War for no reason. How many people really know about this issue? And you know, you mentioned beforehand that you weren't really aware of it and we didn't know each other, but you had heard the Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, yeah. And Brother Joe got wind of that book from our friend Stephen Ranella over at Meat Eater. And I was on the podcast circuit and getting the support of very, very big personalities with great reach. And not necessarily on the conservation conservative side, but more, you know, Joe's platform. And then you have, you know, Stephen with Meat Eater being the hunter, consumptive conservation side. And, you know, Mike and Jack Carr and Mike Ritland and everybody that's in that realm. Um, they just open the door to more exposure that we couldn't talk about under current policy. And that's the only way the rest of the country is not going to make the mistakes we are under regulation where we don't incentivize a criminal element, but let's really stop it. And we, we can do that with good regulation. Um, we need to remember that we're not disparaging you know, you know, cannabis in any way in this discussion. People see a cannabis leaf on the front of that book and they automatically go into a mindset of, oh man, this is so 80s. The Reagan administration just say no. What is he talking about? Is he there? Going? Is back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, it, it was never intended that way. But let's just say uh, the second edition coming out very soon isn't going to have a cannabis leaf on the cover. It's it's redesigned for that reason. But the bottom line is this: um, this isn't a cannabis issue. Uh, I was quoted by the Associated Press about ten years ago of saying if cherry tomatoes were so rare and were three thousand dollars a pound on the black market. We'd probably have EPA banned poison on cherry tomatoes in the national forest and be getting in gunfights with the tomato cartels. As goofy as that sounds, you know? So there's money in this because of the plant, because of the black market, because of the demand, 
And that's what we're fighting. And we're fighting an environmental crime problem, and we're fighting a threat to our public safety and eroding our ability to be in our woods and to be in a rural community and not have a criminal element running our rural community like we saw in Siskiyou County. And that's, that's all I want to see stopped, and I know you guys do too. So I appreciate being able to tell these stories, and the questions are, are great that you're asking because they're triggering some things I haven't discussed for a long time, if at all. Yeah, I'm really happy that you're here to discuss those things. Uh, your book is called Hidden War. You've got the second part coming out in the next couple of months here. Yep. Um, and, and your pictures and your footage really show that it is a hidden war. There are uh, you know, operations being run in and around California and the rest of the country to uh, stop these environmentally damaging grow operations and, and you know, uh, other environmental actions. Um, from uh, you know, when you started, to the day you retired, you've seen uh, you know a lot of different uh, you know damage take place, and you've gone toe to toe with the cartel. Um, how has your view of uh, I guess protecting the environment changed? How has you, how has it personally impacted you as well? This this is a difficult thing to do on a daily basis to face um, not only violence, not only uh, this criminal organization that is incredibly dangerous on a global level. Uh, but to do it really in your backyard? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. No one's ever asked that. And I'm glad you did. And it, it triggers one thought. When early in my career, I thought of wildlife protection being a game warden's focus, and mostly game wardens are going to do it because law enforcement is strapped everywhere. You know, you hear the thin blue line for our police officers, our county sheriffs, our quote unquote mainline law enforcement officers, and not having enough of, of those guys and gals out to handle everything that's happening from the criminal element, right? Um, and we call ourselves the thin green line, and I wear the wristband 24-7 because the thin green line isn't just game wardens now. It's what Joe Rogan said. It's what everybody else said to everyone in this room. We're all part of the thin green line. Whether we're game wardens, whether we're law enforcement, whether we're outdoor adventurers, whether we're just patriots and we want good water, we, want, you know, we don't want poison fentanyl on our streets from these cartels for our kids, we don't want human trafficking going on, we don't want a sex trade that these guys are making billions of dollars off of and exploiting our youth. Um, I never saw it as, that, as a global issue. I thought, well, who, who really cares about wildlife other than game wardens and park rangers and people mandated to do that because the other guys are doing other, other stuff. You know, The public doesn't seem to be really fired up because this issue uh, hasn't really got the attention it needs, so I don't think everybody's really aware of how pervasive and, and damaging these cartel elements, these trespass growers are. And it just took exposure to get more and more people outraged where we started to see it, and that was obviously what happened with book two. My first book that came out in 2010, War in the Woods, was very well received and people were very outraged by the stories and we didn't have met yet and I told stories basically of the early days with uh, working with the Santa Clara County Sheriff's deputies and stuff like that prim and, and isolated Silicon Valley stories. But that got outraged, like how can that be happening in the tech capital of the world? you know? And now we see that it's going on in other states and the other crimes I mentioned tonight. Um, now I look at it still with some optimism um, there is, you know, I, I'm, I've always been a half full kind of guy in the glass. I've never taken any challenge and said we can't do it no matter how intimidating or how many odds, quote unquote, are stacked against me or us. Um, but we do have a lot against us that we got to try to focus through, to push through. Um, political policies right now, um, a mindset, a lack of awareness in the country. Uh, less people getting into the outdoors, more people being urbanized, uh, not understanding what the outdoors even have to offer them because they just haven't been exposed. The one thing we did see through COVID, one of the only positives is with so many people on lockdowns, so much depression, so much alcohol abuse, drug use, and things like that, just to cope with that change of the world, people were flooding lakes. They were going out on hiking trails where they could, where they had that around their urban centers or, or in you know, small communities. Um, I remember uh, 2020, March to about September, a 30 to 40 percent increase in the number of online hunter education courses being taken and hunter safety certificates being obtained and hunting licenses being obtained by traditional non-gun, non-hunting consumptive users. And just realizing that, wow, you know, I just tried to buy groceries and the 
the shelves are bare. I went to Costco and it was like a it was like a riot. I didn't think I was going to make it out of Costco alive for the one toilet paper pallet that showed up, and it looked like a scene out of Walking Dead. And I'm not going to be any part of that. I ran for my life, and I don't. What am I going to do? So we had non absolutely uninvolved conservationists, people that didn't have that in their family history like a lot of us in the room do, realizing I might have to self-sustain. I might call 911 and there might not be anybody to help me. And they were right. And we, we're gonna talk about this in, in the new documentary um, in more depth, but I will suffice to say right now, we have to look at the American public as our own first responders. We have to be ready to rely on ourselves, whether it's protecting our family from the big bad wolf, whether it's a cartel gunman or a looter or somebody that, you know, just wants to prey upon what we have and we're just trying to get by and, and provide for our families. And we might have to do that. We might have to hunt when we have never hunted before because there might not be a food source that we can get at a store. You know, we might need to collect water and purify water. All those things are real realms of reality that we got to look at that COVID kind of warmed us up to that. And even though it wasn't as bad as it could have been, um, it was a shot across the bow to wake up every American, I think, and everybody on this globe, but especially of us here in the country, of what we should all be prepared for, especially in urban centers like where we sit tonight in LA, or when I'm sitting back in the Silicon Valley in the San Jose area where I'm from, when I'm in California, I kind of look around and go, you know, that was, part, that was step one. What if we have another pandemic and it's something like an anthrax where it's 80% fatalities, you know, not 0.01% fatalities? What's the situation going to be like then? Heaven forbid it happened. Let's hope it never does. But I think we're naive not to be prepared in case something like that does. And having conversations with several of your members at dinner, everybody is on the same mindset, on the same page of being prepared for that, either in this state or other states. But... Um, we need to unite as a country and be ready to do that. And not just look out for ourselves, but really have a community looking after each other again, which in all the political divisiveness we had, and we saw this through COVID, so much statues being dropped, you know, right and left just going at it to blows, to death. I mean, literally the death sometimes. So many things that happened, um, a snapshot in time, something American we have not seen in our history, in our lifetimes, definitely not in my lifetime that was a little bit mind-blowing, but it was a real good example of how it's gonna go if we're not prepared. And we need to remember, circling back to the biggest, uh, what, you know, kind of the forte of what the Hidden War story's about that we're talking about tonight is, that culture of chaos, if we go there again and we have another, you know, COVID 2.0, and it's much worse, um, the cartels are just gonna continue to benefit. And they're gonna be laughing at us, they already are. So we need to look at that as Americans, and we need to kind of open our minds and agree to disagree on whatever issues, but really uh, keep, keep our relationships on the home front, look out for each other. And uh, I think our inner border protection has never been more critical, never more important. Um, and it's definitely, like I say in the upcoming production, it's underprioritized, it's underreported, and it's definitely understaffed from the standpoint of trying to stop these problems. And I never envisioned as a game warden, I would think that it would have to be a national priority to stop some of the biggest poachers from doing what they're doing on the public safety front and the wildlife uh, destruction front than treating this as a national emergency like a domestic eco-terrorism war is really what it's gonna take. And that's a tall request anywhere when you think about having to do something like that in America over this issue. Absolutely, incredibly tall request. I mean, you touch on a lot of great points and you bring up um, you know, so many different factors that play into this much broader issue that really spans the nation. It isn't, you know, localized to California, where you primarily worked. It isn't yep. localized to yep. Colorado or, or Texas or Nevada. It's, it's, it's nationwide is what I'm getting from what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it takes a, a certain type of person to get into this field. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested to know is, did you bring this kind of, um, I don't want to say prepper mentality, but this, you know, outdoorsy, this, uh, uh, you know, this love for the wilderness and, and hunting and, and really fending for yourself into this job, or this, is this something that this job gave to you? You know, that's another great question I never asked before. Um, it was a little bit of both. Um, I grew up in the outdoors, you know, I had my hunter safety certificate and license at nine years old. My dad was an avid waterfowl hunter, big game hunter. Uh, he was a fly fisherman. He was a, ch a champion, trap and skeet, you know, competitor. He was the number one 
trap and skeet shooter while he was competing in California to back up on the Olympic team for trap and skeet. So I was in that realm. Mom and dad were both trap and skeet shooters. They were both outdoory. Um, so I was going to be raised by a family of hunters. I didn't know how much I would enjoy it and how, where I would find my, you know, my peace, kind of my sanctuary and really elated joy in that environment. And it wasn't necessarily just hunting. It didn't even have to be around a gun all the time. Backpacking, hiking, you know, I'm learning to backpack for the first time, I think my freshman or junior year in high school in Henry Coast State Park, which is the second largest state park here in California next to Anza Borrego. But that, that park literally is in, you know, the wet, eastern foothills of where I grew up. And I hadn't even been in that park till I think I was 15, 16 years old with a backpack and going in for seven, eight days on these massive spring break in college, winter trips. Um, doing those hikes were just some of the most joyous times of my life and the most confidence inspiring because we're living out of a backpack for six, seven days. And people that don't backpack or don't do any of the Sierra runs or the big uh, trails, it's a daunting task when you look at it with the, without the experience of having been exposed to it. But um, that's where I got all those skills and, and kind of that passion. And then when Fishing Game came around to be a game warden, you know, obviously I'd harvested game, I'd become an effective hunter, I could live, you know, off my back for weeks, months, years at a time if I had to, if I had stuff cashed and way to resupply, just never had to do that yet. Um, so it was a natural flow. And um, I was very young when I got in the Game Wardens Academy. I was 21, maybe 21 and a half. Um, I was in the academy with uh, a lot of skilled law enforcement officers that came over from state parks, primarily, primarily lifeguards that you know were 30, 40 years old. They had a ton of law enforcement experience. And so now I'm running with some big dogs that really know their stuff. And I'm the young guy, and I'm a squad leader in that academy, being the squad leader for a squad of guys twice my age in my early 20s, and still trying to get through the academy and inspection and make all the physical training and the academics and the technical stuff. It was overwhelming, but it was, a late, it was, it was also incredibly gratifying. And I knew it was the right fit. Um, my dad has a saying. He's had it, uh, well, he had it, you know, obviously. He passed in 2013, literally two months um, before we started the pilot program. He passed in May 20, uh, 2013, and we started the pilot program for MET to test it before it went full time in July of 2013. And my dad would always say, hey, LJ, John Jr., me, the woods are my church. He said, you know, this is where I, this is where I feel spirituality. This is where I see God. This is just where my element is. And I see that in you. And that's become my mantra because dad was right. Um, the woods are my church. We have it carved on his wood memorial out in Montana where some ashes are buried, you know, a little memorial to dad because my dad, my uncles, my grandfather, my mom, um, they passed down a tradition of conservation, of adventure, of love for the outdoors. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to say I took it for granted, but I never really internalized the magnitude of what they were giving us as kids, the four of us. I have four, three siblings. Um, and I'm just eternally grateful to them for that because now I'm mentoring kids that are so good-hearted. They're, they're still, they want to go serve their country in the military with everything going on right now. Um, and they've never shot a pistol or a rifle. They've never done a hike. They've never been on a wild hog hunt. And I've got some kids I've mentored with that recently right in the Silicon Valley. And their eyes are like silver dollars. You know, their mind is expanded to what they can do, the confidence they're getting. They're getting better grades in school now. They've got a better confidence plan for what they're going to do with the GI Bill when they go into the military or if they're going to go to college. And, you know, it, it just, I was raised that way. And I almost took it for granted. And so many kids in these urban city centers, or it be LA, San, again, San Jose Bay Area, wherever, uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, New York, it's not isolated to California. I really think it's a detriment and it's really an injustice to our next generation not to at least give them the opportunity to get in the great outdoors and thrive on what we've been, you know, got the opportunity to do. And COVID certainly changed that. Again, the one other positive about the crazy pandemic was the next generation of youth that had not had any outdoor time, suddenly their parents were dragging them into the outdoors because everybody had to get out of the house. And it stuck, you know, so... Um, I'm grateful for that. I'm really, really grateful for that. And I want to see more of that. And I think one of the best parts about being in phase two, I don't call it retirement, being phase two out of operations is doing what we're doing tonight, talking about things, educating, doing outreach, um, teaching teams not to make the mistakes we made on the tactical operational side, but more importantly, taking the wisdom we've picked up through the mistakes of policy and what we've seen on the ground of what's not working 
um, not only in California, but that's a great template for the entire nation, and trying to push to make those, not make those mistakes again for the benefit of our whole nation, especially for our kids. You know, kids have so many challenges with what this, this next generation is going to see, things you and I never thought we'd see growing up. Imagine COVID when we were in second grade or we were in junior high and we're locked down suddenly. I can't even fathom that. You know, yeah, no. and some of the stuff I saw on media stuff and some of the stuff we cover in the documentary, the divisiveness and our forefathers, our conservation forefathers, our founding fathers and all destruction and fights and, you know, uh, I mean, deadly fights over a different ideology or a different mindset of where the country should be or where the country shouldn't be. And just a whole different frame of reference than how you and I were raised and where we come from. Um, we have a lot. We have a lot of challenges. Uh, and I'm going to do everything I can to keep the thin green line in everybody's front door on everybody's dinner table, not necessarily literally, but exposed to what we have left. And that's why I say the thin green line has never been thinner, is our environmental resources have never been under siege to the level they have until now in our history. And we talk about this again uh, around the documentary, um, the conservation forefathers you know, Teddy Roosevelt, out of Leopold, John Muir, many others, uh, Rachel Carson, you know, there's so many uh, that have done amazing things for conservation as a whole and adventure as a whole and giving us places to go. I can't imagine what they'd say today if they just woke up and looked around <laughs> and got a little bit of blip on, you know, some reel off Instagram and went, oh, I'm not on earth. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> you know, this, this can't, this is, whoa, whoa, this is not what I started. What just happened? So uh, we want to write the tide as much as we can, and we're definitely going to try. That's great. And, uh, you know, going back to your team days, going back mm -hmm. to the days when you were, you know, on that kind of front line here, mm -hmm. um, one thing we at the club like are not only the success stories, not only the, the tales of the good days, the, mm -hmm. you know, the days where we reached the peaks, uh, but the hard days. Yeah. and the challenges that were faced. And if you could touch on that, some of the things that didn't go right, some of the things that you learned from and implemented new uh, strategies for, that would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, I think one of, the, one of the most frustrating and heartbreaking developments was right around 2016 and uh, through late 2015 up, up through 2017, and it still continues now. My colleagues are still dealing with this, but that picture that just came up, Mm. Phoebe put up a great picture. That's Canine Ice, now retired. He's a federal dog, not one of ours with an agency. But Phoebe, Canine Phoebe, worked with that dog Ice several times. I, would, I had the privilege of watching those dogs work together. And what was happening with our federal LEO partners from Forest Service, BLM, and other agencies, and what was happening with our dogs is these cartel elements were realizing that there were some dogs out there that were wrecking lives. I mean, they were getting really good. They were taking out tier one growers that were brought up from Mexico that were really good at what they're doing, rarely got detected or caught. So these dogs were costing these cartels because we were effectively taking them out of, out of circulation without gunfights and without injury to ourselves, um, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So they started to develop their counter tactics of, mm. okay, we're gonna figure out how these guys operate. We understand deadly force rules of engagement that American law enforcement can and can't do. So we're not going to pull guns necessarily when we see that team coming and we know they have a dog, but if that dog's deployed, we're going to you know, shield our, our, our neck and jugular vein area. We're going to take that bite and we're going to have a fixed blade knife next to our pistol. Mm. Uh, we're not going to grab the pistol, but we're going to go for that fixed blade or that, you know, I've seen sharpened deer bones made into like um, little shanks and we're going to go right for the jugular or I get forward of those ribs in that dog and that's what happened to Ice there, he took a direct intentional stabbing after being sucked in on a legitimate dog bite. And it's really a miracle that that little guy survived because he had lost a ton of blood. Um, I don't know how many stitches he had to have right through that vital area, but by the good graces, he survived that ordeal and came wow. back to be a kick butt little canine and retired like Phoebe did with a, you know, with a, a great career of bites behind him and doing great work. But there were two federal dogs that same year that didn't make it. Um, there were situations where our canine Phoebe and canines I can't mention names of that are still operational that you know were came came after Phoebe. Uh, man, she's like uh, like one of these NFL you know linemen that are in concussion protocol, like you know rot with injury four or five times a season. Mm -hmm. I, I, she had twenty lives. I don't. She, she had been hit with rocks. She had been you know hit with hammers. Um, we, you know, on some of these chases before we would get to the dog, 
you would have the situation where these guys are, they're not giving up. They're gonna fight the dog, they're tough. And they're gonna do everything they can not to get caught by the dog. And if they're not on the ground getting bit and they get out of the bite, they're gonna fight any way they can. And Phoebe took a lot of hard hits, a lot of cuts. She was never you know, terminally wounded. She never had anything that she couldn't bounce back from. But we had to change tactics, you know, obviously, be really close to our dogs when we deploy them. And I'm not a dual purpose handler by any means. I've just worked around so many of them and supported them and they are they are the you know the magic men working and magic women working with these amazing amazing animals partners, um, but the game had to change and we had to protect our dogs and we've done that and again knock on wood um, since I've left operations here in phase two, none of our dogs have been hurt and I've heard of very few other if any um, other agency dogs taking hits because it was a real wake up call what happened to ICE and some other federal uh, federal partners and. Um, that was those were mistakes that could have cost us not only a dog but you know a partner of the heart and it would have, I don't think I'd recover from that if I had been running that mission mm. and made that call or if the handler had made that call and you know we lost a dog it it happens we're in a, a combat type situation uh, my special operations brothers SEAL team dog handlers that I work with a lot and know and have ch uh, conversed on ideas talking with Mike Ritland on Mike Drop podcast it was very dog heavy he's a SEAL SEAL team, you know, veteran, canine expert, very intrigued by Phoebe's story and obviously two peas in a pod talking dogs. Um, what war dogs face, what domestic law enforcement dogs face, it's, it's a very imprecise science, you know, the way this thing works. Um, every situation is different and we want them to go home like we need us to go home. They're partners, they're not just tools. Uh, we never want to see a dog, you know, farmed out there for, for the sake of sacrifice, and we won't allow that. And the teams I am working with right now, we're very, very careful to use that type of mindset that your dog's going to have to work and going to have to make some sacrifices. It's just the way this game is with very violent criminals that we're going up against, but we're not going to make it easy for them, you know. And, and it's really neat to see agencies I'm working with now developing their canine deployment processes and policies around what we learned the hard way. You know, anything we can do now that I can do, that my teammates can do, while they're still at agency working with other agencies, or what they're going to do when they retire, um, get into phase two, hopefully like I've done, is just help teams develop and um, eliminate the growing pains, make the learning curve. You know, instead of three and a half years, in six months to a year. You can have a you can be in really good shape and on your way to having a, an amazing canine handler team that are going to be really really effective and really really safe, and that just takes make a mistake sadly when you're the first to kind of do it and that was us. Got it. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I mean, just looking at this photo of this dog, what a you know grisly thing to go through for the dog primarily, but then also for you guys as you know the ones running the team. Um, to yep. see that this is the kind of harm that people want to do to yeah. you guys and these animals that you you know rely on as teammates. Uh, you mentioned briefly that uh, you know the cartel adjusted yeah. to you guys using dogs, and you know you were you know at least had a hand in bringing right. these dogs into into these teams. Sure. So there's there's a level of kind of adapt adaptation uh, and growth on both sides. What do you see uh, happening in the future, the next couple of years? How is that, uh, gonna grow and change and how, how, how are the cartel going to grow and change and how are you guys going to grow and change? It's going to, it's going to continue to be a cat and mouse game. Um, as they evolve, we're going to evolve and we're just going to, it's going to be a one up or change tactics. And, you know, they're going to be harder to catch because they're going to do something that's going to make it harder for our dogs to get to them. And we've already seen that with the, you know, trying to take our dogs out where it's going to happen so fast that we're not going to be, we're not, maybe not going to have that opportunity to engage and stop that threat before they take out one of our dogs. Um, the way the current kind of atmosphere and mindset is in the country right now politically and with an open border right now, um, we have emboldened the cartels. So they're going to become more dangerous without a doubt. Um, we know they're running with heavy weaponry in some of the southwest states. We've seen reels, we've seen videos of these guys running ethnic music nice and loud in their Escalator 4x4 with 50 caliber machine guns and AKs going right past Phoenix Police Department laughing about it. So they're here. 
And they know that, again, we kind of have, we've settled from, you know, pandemic A with COVID, but what type of response and what type of taxing and um, depletion of, of law enforcement resources we've seen nationally, how strained out we are as game wardens doing cannabis and mainline patrol and, you know, a lot of law enforcement officers leaving the job because of what they experienced during COVID and the lack of support. Um, it was horrendous for protest, crowd control teams. Our guys integrated with some of that. And I've talked to a lot of brothers in blue and sisters in blue that are no longer in law enforcement jobs. They mm -hmm. were done after what they experienced. So cartels know that. So this is something we have to look at as Americans outside of law enforcement circles that you could run across these people in, in town, in the forest. Um, you know, yeah, moving a group of humans illegally. Um, abducting your kids. And it's, it's not a fun thing to talk about, and it's, it's a very, very grim reality, but it's something we gotta at least address and not live in fear, but you know, hold back and take back our country, take back our streets, but be prepared. And the biggest solution, obviously, that's gonna empower us to be effective is preparedness and acceptance of where we're at. And again, being self-reliant on knowing we may not have um, an official or a law enforcement presence to solve the problem, and that's what I see. I just see these cartels become more emboldened. Uh, cartel cannabis is probably gonna decline a little bit because even the market in that, especially for the Mexican cartels, is dwindling. They're not totally out of the game, but the fentanyl, the human trafficking, especially gun running and all the other things we talked about, the meth, we're seeing record highs of that, killing record numbers of people right now, are, is the white dope crimes that are all cartel-based, making them billions of dollars and eroding and killing our, our public and our kids too, so that's what I see. If we don't attack this as a national policy, tighten the, you know, kind of circle the wagons, and we look at this as an American priority, you know, from us as citizens all the way to our administration and our law enforcement assets, we're gonna need it. Hmm. Now from a more practical point of view, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a backpacker, I'm a hiker. There you go. Many people in this room go out regularly. Uh, you know, let's say somebody stumbles across uh, something they shouldn't, what are your recommendations? Good one to talk about, and I was going to hit you on that, and you asked it at a perfect time. <laughs> um, you, you're, you guys are hiking in the woods. You see black poly pipe like some of these pictures you've seen. Uh, you see a, you know, a camp. Maybe you see, heaven forbid, bad guys with guns and camouflage, or you see cannabis plants. Um, if you've been in the outdoors enough where you've hiked around but you can be stealthy like a hunter, take some photographs. Um, understand exactly where that is happening. If um, Usually there's a geotag on any photograph you take, um, or you can find it on a map later, and just back out of that area as, as quietly as you can. Don't make a lot of noise. Um, nine times out of 10, people don't have a problem. They get out of it safely, as long as they don't panic, as long as they don't make noise. Um, there have been some hikers, there have been some hunters, there have been some father-son, father-daughter teams out there on hunting season and they've, they've had shots fired at them. They haven't been hit fortunately. We had that up in Northern California a couple years ago. That is usually, the, uh, that is usually rare. Um, that is not the norm, it's the exception because these guys don't want to engage you unless they have to because they know once they do, their operation is burned for sure. So it's the one advantage we have here in America versus the cartels operating down in Mexico. They're very, very blatant about infighting down south. They're very blatant about fighting with the federales because it's turf wars. Up here, they're only gonna go loud and get Western, we like to say, with gun violence if they're being directly threatened, either by us or someone coming into their grow that they don't know, usually. Um, but that's something you wanna do. Just document where it's at, get out of the area quietly, and, and get on 911 and call your county sheriff, game wardens, whoever, and report it because especially in California now, all these agencies are dedicated toward cannabis enforcement. We're all funded big. Um, we have to respond, whether it's private land or public land or whatever, and that's the way to do it. Great, that's, that's good stuff. And in terms of geography, where are you seeing it most? Where are we seeing I mean, is it Southern California down by Anza? Is it Northern California? Is it even spread? Yeah, Grant, it's everywhere. Um, anywhere where there's a south facing slope, some brush for the outdoor trespass stuff, national forest, county parks, um, wilderness areas. It could be anywhere uh, of, the, uh, you know, of those, those, those areas I just described. The stuff that's in plain sight on private land, but it's outdoor in remote counties, and LA, North LA County and the deserts have some of the biggest and uh, you know, 
water stealing, completely unregulated growth sites that have a lot of human trafficking going on within them. They have a lot of cartel grow guys with, nat with warrants worldwide. You run across those guys, if you're on the wrong property, it could get very deadly. Fortunately, most of us aren't going into those private land areas as recreationalists. We gotta be concerned mostly with the outdoor trespass stuff. Um, but just, just know that it happens anywhere we have good sunlight, south-facing slopes, annual water typically, and they don't have to be that far off the beaten path hmm. because these guys will do them very quietly, hide in plain sight. I've literally seen them four or 500 yards um, in an area called Foothill Park in eyeshot of Stanford University uh, in, uh, up in Palo Alto, uh, a 32,000 plant grow that had been in play for five or six years with kids hiking trails right on the edge of the grow and they had never had, thankfully, an interaction because it just hadn't happened yet. So they could be anywhere. So just stay in the woods. Don't give up on going out there. You know, your chances of running into one as they decrease and because they are so spread out, probably not going to happen. But it'd be, I wouldn't be surprised to get calls from you guys or hear an update story, you know, next summer or the summer after that you found a grow site. Um, <laughs> hikers found a grow site right on the Ortega Highway up in Tanaha Canyon, my old patrol area in Riverside County, literally earlier this year that we talked about on California Insider. Um, and you know, there was, there was no violent conflict, no growers were caught, it was like 2,800 plants, carbofuran, EPA banned poisons were everywhere. Yeah. They made their dent, we, we, took, we took care of it. Um, but that was in our national forest, literally off you know, the divider between Orange and, and uh, Riverside County. Wow. You know, I'd love to know what the restoration looks like after that. So you, you, you come through, you sweep out the growers, you cut down the plants. There's still a presence of toxins. Yeah. There's still something uh, there that needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Uh, what does that look like? It's a mess. And up until MET was formed up in 2013, nobody besides us and some of the federal agencies were actually reclamating and cleaning up those growth mm -hmm. sites. And now we make that a point to do it on all of them. The sheriffs are doing them. Santa Clara County sheriffs were pivotal in taking that upon themselves. Uh, in 06 and 07 when I was with those guys because they believed in the environment. They were conservationists and outdoor enthusiasts like we are. Um, and that was the first time I ever saw a non-conservation focused agency come in and you know make that a priority. But now we're doing it with all the agencies and other agencies that won't help us with that, we typically won't work with. Mm. Um, you know, the, uh, the cannabis money, the one good thing about Prop 64 that has worked, it's put a fair amount of money in agencies' hands. So we have money to reclamate. We have our own helicopter. Uh, we're able to fly in the off season and you know take these the trash and restore the waterways. All of that has to happen, um, and we're doing a lot of it. But we're not getting them all. There's historical growth sites that are 10 years old that haven't been reclamated and cleaned up yet. Mm. And now we're getting um, non-governmental organizations and volunteer groups trained and, and trying to build with some nonprofits to be certified to go in with our help. And, uh, and reclimate those growth sites. And that's a trend we're gonna see throughout California, especially because we have a lot to clean up still. Sounds like it. Sounds like there's a lot to go in and do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it sounds like an incredibly challenging job. <laughs> sounds like an incredibly challenging job to go in and deal with this uh, day in and day out. And then on the backside of it, after you've uh, you know, really moved out of this position to then spread awareness and, and challenge people yeah. to really think about this more critically and grow in their understanding of uh, the challenges faced in California and around the country. Uh, but shifting into a more kind of personal track here, you're an adventurer outside of your job. Mm -hmm. You go and you travel the world and, and you do uh, things all over the place. And I'd love to touch on that, some of the experiences that you've had uh, outside of this kind of law enforcement career. Yeah, yeah the good thing is my, you know, the, I've, I've always, like I said, I've always been a hunter and a conservationist, a backpacker and, and done that. I've been in, uh, do endurance athleticism, did a lot of that up through MET and before MET and my, my operational time. Um, you know, hunted all over the globe and had some really amazing hunts in New Zealand and in Alaska and South Africa. And that was the first time I'd ever gone overseas to be able to do stuff like that. Um, but I've also been a desert Baja racer down in Mexico for years, mm. years, um, on an ATV primarily, a little bit on the side by sides and, um, always done, supported some really, a really cool orphanage down there. But the, one of the coolest accomplishments, I think challenges and most elated adventures was trying to be the first to solo the Baja 500 on an ATV without relay other riders in the time limit. And I'd attempted to do it in 2010 and I made the finish line, but I was 22 minutes past the 22 oh. hour oh. deadline. Oh. 
because so many stranded vehicles on the way in, including me, I broke down in the middle of the night, went off a 10-foot cliff, broke a tie rod, was stuck there for five hours, rescued another motorcycle that went into the cliff. Um, yeah, that was quite a wet, that was quite an adventure to say the least. Uh, no, no, you know, bad, bad injuries, but it was pretty, pretty nuts. Um, and just helping people get out, I, I missed the fin. I made the finish line, but missed the deadline. Hmm. And it was that was a very agonizing race. I was pretty tore up from that physically, mentally. Um, but I came back in 2013, in June, knowing that I was about to start Met. And once I started Met with exactly what we were targeting for bad guys, I probably wasn't going to be racing in Mexico after that anytime soon. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and crushed that race. Did it in 16 hours, had a great race, um, and nobody had done that on a, on a quad yet. Nobody had soloed the 500. And it was, uh, it, it, that felt good, but what we were able to do with the kids we were supporting down there, with the schools, with the soccer equipment, the farm they were building, um, people just like to support races and give you financial support for other communities that could really, really use it if you're out there doing dumb, crazy stuff like trying to solo races like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that was, that was a really, really cool adventure. I think that's, um, that's probably a top 10. And I, uh, I completed two Ironman long courses in 07 and 09, oh, wow. which were you know, kind of bucket list goals. I was never a swimmer before. I was never a lot. I was a bicyclist. Um, I was a runner, but I was not a swimmer. And I had several family members say, you do all that other endurance stuff, but you're not really a swimmer. And you're going to go do a 2.4 mile open water on the ocean in some lake and with 1,000 other swimmers and go and do that. And I said, well, let's see how that goes. And that was intimidating. It was scary, you know, to do that level of swimming. Um, but I worked on it, and I did it. And, uh, and I did two of those races. And those were, uh, those were really good races when they happened because that's when we were first starting to get into the cartel cannabis stuff in those really extreme situations. Um, and I think besides the physical endurance, the mental toughness, mm and the ability to push through. And just, um, we have a saying that um, you'll see in the book, and I won't tease where it's gonna be. For those of you picking up copies of Hidden More, either the, the, first, the last of the first edition or the second edition, um, fill and flow. You know, you've heard the term improvise, overcome, and adapt, or you know, do the best with what you have where you're at as you can, right? Um, we're that team. Game Warden's cut off, backcountry, middle of nowhere, and we're in a gunfight now. Mm. And I got a warden that shot through both legs by an AK-47, bleeding out of four holes, and we're, we're waiting like three long hours for an air rescue. How are we gonna get off this hill safely? Is he gonna die of shock? Is he gonna lose you know, too much blood? All of those things, and just being able to stay focused, keep your task on hand, be responsible, and, and implement exactly what you're supposed to. Don't try to overthink it, don't underdo, just do your job to the best of your ability. And that's how you conquer anything, um, either alone or with a really good team. And I've been really lucky to be with really, really good teams. As much as stuff I do, and being a game warden is a very, it's a very alone type of thing. Hmm. You know, usually you're patrolling alone. You might have your canine. You don't have a partner patrolling with you most of the time. You don't have backup, a squad car around the next block or five minutes away in the city. I could be seven, eight miles behind a locked gate or in the national, or, you know, in a wilderness area, and no one's coming to get me before, you know, they're looking for my body. Um, so when we have teams like MET and having operators around me in a situation like that, there's a lot of em emboldenment, there's a lot of empowerment in that, a lot of confidence. Um, and that's what all those endurance sports and, and adventures of taking that crazy hunt, going on that canoe trip you, you mentioned, canoeing the Amazon for two months. You'll be able to, I mean, the mindset of what you can do is limitless and, you know, nothing's impossible after something like that is accomplished. And that's how I felt after both Ironman races and then especially doing the Baja 500. Hmm. Um, and then I got into all the drama and I'm glad I did those events before we got into tactical operations against the cartels because they really helped. They helped, I think, mentally more than physically on any level. It was just, the, it was the mental confidence um, and the mental, the mental stability to deal with chaos and just, you know, do the best you can, you know, in that chaos. And, and we've come out on top almost every time. We've been very fortunate, but it helps. That's great. And um, like you said, uh, overcoming that chaos, right? It's important. And Kill and flow always. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there could be a level of internal chaos as well. Uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier, dealing with a lot of the violence that comes out of it and going into a field that seems, at least on the surface, um, very outdoor oriented and very um, peaceful almost. Right. 
and then you know coming in and clashing in this way uh, that can be intensely violent. It takes a toll, um, and uh, mm -hmm. you know I'd love to touch on that a little bit more if if uh, you wouldn't mind you know yeah, going I, into I, that. One one thing I think on that that it, it brings up a good point is game wardens, unlike most other law enforcement, deal with guns and people with guns all the time, like ninety plus percent of the time. Yet 95% of those people with guns are our friends. They're our allies. They're like-minded. They're 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 part of the thin green line. You know, they're not going to do us harm. They're gonna they're gonna take up arms against the cartel if we're attacked. Nine times out of ten, they're allies. Um, so the peacefulness, from the standpoint of the public concept of what a game warden is, is exactly what you say. It's like we're kind of Smokey the Bear. We're checking hunters all the time. It's peaceful. It's that one to two to three percent when stuff gets really crazy and we're up against somebody that doesn't want to be peaceful with a gun and they know we're one game warden by ourselves, um, that is, there's a lot of mental work that goes into being comfortable doing that. Um, having a background of growing up around firearms, being raised the way I was, I was immediately comfortable in scenarios in the academy at the start of my career and immediately comfortable going out and not freaking out when I had three different field training officers for a month at a time evaluating me through all these deer seasons in the state of California when I got out of the academy to go and do the job. And then we get a new generation of cadets that never fired a weapon. They lived in the city all their life. Um, they know the battle kit so well from Call of Duty 5 because uh, they built the same kit that I'm actually shooting, but they've never shot the gun. And I, I've literally had cadets name off stuff like they came out of a SEAL team. I'm like, so you have that gun, man, you must be really good. Well, no, it's one of the kits I use in my game and I changed it, I just saw yours and it was the same as mine. And I went, oh, okay. So we're gonna have to train <laughs> and we're gonna have to go real firearms training versus the virtual stuff. So um, there's that advantage, man, there's that advantage. So a lot of our new generation of law enforcement general, game wardens as well, are having that issue because they just haven't had that exposure. And it doesn't mean they're not going to be great law enforcement officers or great public servants. They're going to be. They're just, there's going to be some uphill challenges, longer challenges, um, confidence building within, and all those things. And it's going to take a lot of peer support. We've definitely, I've definitely seen that as a trainer, and so have my colleagues. But dealing with the chaos, as you say, is something that it's not a normal way, it's not a normal lifestyle, if you will, mm. not a, you know, what people would consider a normal lifestyle. And military veterans know this, especially if they've seen a lot of combat. Um, coping, peer support, um, utilizing psychological professionals and counseling services were, you know, the old days, we didn't want to talk about it, we didn't want to show weakness. Those days are gone and they should be. There's so much to sharing the story and cathartically healing through that story with other people that have experienced it or others that haven't that you can share it with that will relate and actually care, that is a healing process. So when I talk about a gunfight with you guys, whether you've been involved in one or not, I know you have some concern or you wouldn't have asked. And that to me is very complimentary. That's very helpful and I'm very grateful for that. Um, when this thing first, the first gunfight that happened in 05, I don't wanna talk about it at all. You know, I mean, I was guilty that I had a new officer that was on that and he got shot right next to me. Why didn't I get shot? You know, guy trained in the academy, exemplary game warden, thank heaven he survived. He's one of the best game wardens I've ever known. Lieutenant now, finishing his career, has a bunch, has kids and a great family. But what if it had gone the different way? What if he hadn't survived that ordeal? Would we have continued doing this work? Would we be having this conversation and being part of a different twist on the thin green line? Would that have been my story and the story of all my colleagues and, and game wardens in general back in California? Um, we might not be talking right now. So there's a lot, a lot of heavy stuff to fathom with that. I'm just glad it went the way it did. I feel very blessed and very lucky that we didn't lose anybody that day on the hill and we were this close to uh, it not coming out good. Hmm. Yeah, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, difficult thing to live through for sure mm -hmm. and uh, carry with you. Um, yeah. Moving into the future, I'd love to know what's next. What's uh, next for you? What's coming up over the horizon? Well, as we're uh, just doing as much as I can on the thin green line for the sake of the country, not just California, but the whole nation. You know, I want to see waterways, wildlife, and wild lands preserved with a conservation model. So hunting is encouraged and done ethically, and our, our species thrive through that. Our next generation gets out there and at least get the opportunity to enjoy the outdoors like we all do here in this room, and whether they choose to stay out there or not. I mean, that's, that's totally up to the individual. 
Um, and I just want to see a safer America and a more unified America. It breaks my heart to see so much political divisiveness and hatred um, and uh, just where, where we've gone in such a short amount of time. And I still stay uh, relatively optimistic that we can turn the tide and we can turn the tide um, with acceptance and unify a little more tighter and, and keep this, you know, this massive polarization eliminated. But I think a lot of it starts with the outdoors as a healer. Hmm. And that's just the game warden and that's just the outdoor adventure in me. I really think um, it's hard for people, you know, to fight at a protest in a rally in a, in a city. It's not hard for them to get fired up maybe in a city environment in total chaos, you know, but get out in the woods and be around a campfire or sit on the edge of a stream or a lake or a river, watching the sunrise, sunset, animals watering on it, bighorn sheep, deer, whatever the case may be. And somebody that thinks completely different than you politically can have a totally different experience, but I guarantee everybody will get a little something out of that and maybe enough to break the ice enough where we just listen and we don't condemn. And I think nature is gonna be one of the biggest healers for our future, and if we lose nature, if we lose our resources, then we're going to continue down the slippery slope uh, that we're on, and I and I, then I become very pessimistic for us as a community of Americans. And I'm just going to do everything I can to continue doing what we're doing here tonight. Talk about it, educate on it, share my mistakes, mentor, help, whatever I can. I feel very lucky to do what I do. Um, I had an amazing career. Uh, Thirty, almost thirty years felt like ten. Um, and I just, uh, I just want to keep it going and help where I can and speak freely now. And I'm going to do more of that. Definitely with the books and the productions we're doing and t uh, a good forum like you guys sitting here tonight and, and, and giving me a chance to talk and share a story. I greatly appreciate it and just uh, hope to do it again. All right. Now, my final question before I open it up to questions. Okay. Uh, the Hidden War is out. It's out. You can get it on Amazon and through you. You can get a very few handful of copies of edition one. This is the hardcover, the first run. Um, we're down to under 100 copies, and most of them I have. So you want, you guys want the good first hardcover with all the color and, and all the graphics and stuff, get them for me tonight, or you know, hit me up afterwards and we can do some shipping on personalized. There's gonna be a few left. There was an audible version of that that I read for. Hmm that was done really, really well. That's gonna stay, obviously. That's digital, so it stays. The ebook will stay. Um, but we have a second edition of this coming out in two months, Hidden War, second edition. It's a trade paperback. Um, it's gonna have uh, some new material, but you're gonna lose some material from the original, so it's gonna be a give and take, but it's gonna be some updated stuff we talked about, new cover design, and a couple other surprises that I'm not gonna drop yet. But suffice to say, they're going to be two unique books, and you might want to look at both of them. And, I, and copies of War in the Woods, the first book, are still available on Amazon. And also, I keep, keep some of those in if everybody, anybody wants those. That's great. And then uh, when is the documentary coming out? We're shooting for early spring next year. Early spring. Um, okay. But I'm finding through the post-production phase, um, I think we're going to be on track for that. But we're, we're looking at early next year. That's great. Yeah. I love it. I'm excited for the documentary. I'm excited for the second edition of uh, Hidden War. And uh, I'm excited to pick up a copy of Hidden War from you today. Awesome. awesome. Uh, I know we've covered a lot of ground, and I would yeah. love to open the floor to questions uh, and see what our membership has to ask. Well, we got some good ones already, I can tell. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lance Miller, uh, 1222. Great presentation. I, early on, you were saying you used to do a lot of media with all the news stations. And I, did you say before the gag order? And, yeah. and could you expand on that? Because this is something I feel should be headline on Thank every you. single news yeah. station. Yeah, ba basically, um, about it, it was before I retired, we had a change of administration and uh, any of our press related to cannabis enforcement was gonna go through a press information officer, um, kind of in headquarters. It, was, uh, it was, wasn't gonna be me as a lieutenant of the team talking to a press crew or bringing press crews out to a site that we could safely show them. Um, a lot of that had to do, I think, with the politics of sanctuary state and the fact that the story and the presence of the of California citizens constantly being reminded of all the cartel criminals we're arresting on news, you know, newsreels or documentaries. That's just something that the governor's office didn't want out there. So our department had to get very stringent on what we would release 
and it would be it would be released by other people, you know, uh, in the press information world. Um, but they're they're not doing the press that they used to do, like what we're talking about tonight, so freely. And it, it just had to do with that change, I think, um, kind of the political direction with sanctuary state, um, and we just got shut down at this level, uh, you know, to to put it mildly. So, great question. A uh, great question, and thank you for the support to get this out there and make the hidden more uh, not so hidden. So you guys are going to help me with that. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for this presentation. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about jurisdictions, um, either for uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife or in other enforcement agencies that are working in this, and kind of where our blind spots are. Yeah, good question. Um, right now, jurisdiction is uh, under Prop 64. Fortunately, it's been expanded. There's been like the Department of Cannabis Control, the Water Board has some jurisdiction because all the environmental component stuff is being addressed. Um, county sheriffs are doing a lot of work with this. Game Warden's Cannabis Enforcement Program is now, I think, 79 or 85 of our 400 wardens are dedicated just to cannabis enforcement. Um, U.S. Forest Service on, on their forests are still doing it. So everybody's still involved in it and more agencies are involved in it now. Um, I think the blind spots are just, we continue to put enforcement and throw enforcement at the problem, which is great, but we're only gonna be so effective, no matter how many bodies we throw at this, if the law ch stays the way it is. Uh, the big blind spot is the California public not demanding that Prop 64 statutes be modified. It's not that we're regulating, because I really think we should regulate cannabis for the benefit of regulation nationally, not just in California, but we gotta bring the felony back in to trespass grows, illegal grows on private land. We gotta have an incentive, we gotta de-incentivize these guys from stealing water, from putting EPA banned toxics, from trafficking humans, forced labor, from the cartels. That has to change or we are literally spitting in the wind. You know, we're gonna make a very little dent and that's a great question because that is the, it's the biggest blind spot I've ever seen. And that's what I've been pushing even before we had the law regulated. And now I'm certainly saying it a lot more freely in these documentaries in the book. And, and, and you're going to hear me say more of it. And you're going to hear see journalists down on the border right now that I've teamed up with, like Jorge from Daily Caller. Uh, Fox is getting some real good stuff on this, non-biased, just showing you what's really going on. And that's what it's going to take. So great question. Uh, Chuck, you know, I thanks so much for what you're doing. You and I, I personally, I don't trust the media all that much, especially more recently. I agree. And certainly not the uh, the politicians in the political uh, yeah. arena. And I think we were sold a bill of goods on this Prop 64. I mean, I don't use any of this stuff. Right. And the fact that they they, it seems like in in society when you see things good things that are made to look bad and bad things are made to look good. Yeah. Something's up about that. Yeah. So I think there's also a little bit of a spiritual thing about this whole thing, that we need to get back to some of our roots and not listen to all these people, these political people that are trying to uh, force stuff down our throats. That's why I just don't listen to the media and don't believe a lot of it. So like the border, the crime, I mean, that that's, should be really uh, obvious to all of us. Yeah. So what can we do other than just get this word out and try to hopefully let people understand that uh, you know, these things are happening? And thanks for your work. Yeah, no, thank you. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think we need to look at what's happening right now and, and focus on what's happening within our borders. We're involved in, we have our fingers in so much internationally, I get that. But right now, the home front, man, has never been more at, at, at threat, you know, in siege. And, and I agree with you. We need everybody to at least know, and knowledge is power, before we make some bad decisions in the next election, you know, in the midterms, any of it. Um, policies just in California. I mean, we gotta really, really be careful, and we need better leadership in a lot of places, and I'm not, you no need to mention names, but you know, it's, it's getting real obvious who really cares about the country, um, and not just themselves and their personal gain, and, and that's what we're gonna need to see, so you're spot on, sir, thank you. <coughs> sir. Hi, uh, Jorge, just a guest that comes here pretty frequently. Um, your talk was absolutely amazing, both informative and entertaining, along with very interesting, just, the topic in and of itself, um, if we just you know kind of look back in the past five years, what you've done has increased in difficulty exponentially with yeah. open borders, uh, legalization of recreation in 2016, um, the pandemic, just 
how much more difficult for you and your team would you say it's gotten in the last five years? Like, just give us a ballpark. Oh man, um, I think exponentially is a good description, and it's you know it's it's not an exaggeration. Um, I'm still kind of in awe that the marijuana enforcement team, my old colleagues, and a lot of new members are still out doing the work and still stopping cartel threats as much as they are. Um, but it's, it, it has gotten a lot harder. I know there's a lot of, you know, just it's hard to keep morale with the teams. Um, and it's getting to a point of burnout where we know we're playing whack-a-mole. And we know every time we play whack-a-mole, like I tell the guys and I tell new teams, I said, look, you're not going to stop the problem. You're not even going to come close the way the law is written and the way the priorities of our leadership in California are. But what you can do is know that every illegal growth site you stop, every poison plant you take out, every water diversion you stop, you've made a dent for that day. You've saved some wildlife. You've saved some precious gallons of water in this one of the, you know, the state having the second largest drought in you know, 100 years in California. So you did some good for that day that isn't going to just last that day. Now, it's probably going to be you know, a couple grains of sand on the beach. I get that, but we got to try. I said, so look at this as a marathon and have, or like an Ironman. I said, you know, there were parts in my Ironman races between the run, the swim, and that biking where I would be literally, okay, um, my next race is a mile, and I'm going to go a mile. And when I make a mile, I'm going to race one more mile. You know, and I just make that analogy to the guys. I said, dude, look at it as, you know, the NFL like a running game. You know, you're not going vertical down the field for the 80-yard, 50-yard, you know, Aaron Rodgers super bomb. You're doing chunk plays. And you're, and you're pounding it. And you're hit, and, and you know, and you're, you're literally, man, smash-mouthing it just to get a yard. But a yard was a big victory today. You know, for lack of a better analogy. That's a poor one, I know. But the one and the other one. You just got to look at small victories right now and know that if we give up trying, we give up not only on the environment, we, don't, we give up on public safety, but we kind of give up on ourselves as Californians, Montanians, or whatever, as Americans. Um, and I, I am encouraged right now because what little I'm deciphering from everybody kind of waking up on both sides of the you know, political spectrum, we're frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. The left, the right are frustrated. And what is that, that's bringing a little bit of unity that's bringing a little bit more acceptance, and people are starting to come together a little more and not judge each other. And like I said, sitting on that creek together with an extreme left, extreme right, two completely different ideologies, and let's just sit here and let's just share some ideas and just listen. We don't have to. We can agree to disagree, but we can't agree to let, let someone else destroy our country out from under us and use this divisiveness to their advantage. Um, and I think that's the winning ticket, and that's what fires me up every day. But again, we got to be able to talk about it. I'm glad I do. So yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. And very good point. Hi, Raymond, uh, member 1233. Raymond. So uh, you know, looking at all the videos and pictures and hearing the stories, uh, I had a quick question. In any of the uh, operations where you were busting uh, these grow uh, stations, did you ever have any encounters with wildlife, uh, whether they were negative or positive, any that you might remember? That's a good question. Um, as far as like animals we'd encounter that would be possibly dangerous and alive, um, nothing like that, but a lot of dead animals and groves. A lot of dead animals. Um, the threatened endangered Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep that are a subspecies of the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, they only exist in the Lone Pine, High Sierra, Eastern Sierras, not far from here. That herd was at 600 sheep. We put multi-million dollars as an agency, Fish and Wildlife, my old California Department of Fish and Wildlife, it, at getting those numbers up. And I remember um, one of the things I, I, I couldn't really talk about a lot in the book at the time, but our snipers were deployed over on that, that side of, the, for, uh, that side of the, the world, so to speak, um, to kind of look over some, some uh, animal depredation stuff that was going on and actually found a grow site and found dead black bears and dead mountain lions that were poisoned and then found like this magnificent 17-year-old ram that literally was probably the last and the biggest of the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep, mm. a threatened endangered species that had been so weakened from ingesting poisons, a predator got him down and that carcass was in that grow. And that was where I saw so many pristine big game wildlife species in one of the most pristine areas of California, you know, at 12,000 feet there, you know, below Mount Whitney, heartbreaking. 
and we've seen a lot of that, a lot of deadlines, a lot of dead bears, some of the pitchers that rotated up, and I have so many more like the, the dead fox. Uh, Phoebe's putting one up right there, a good one there. Uh, a big 400-pound black bear sow and her little baby cub that die from ingesting poisons together. There's the mother. She dies a couple minutes after licking up some of this stuff that the growers put out in a tuna can to get them before they get to the grows. And then in the next picture, that's her little baby that ingested poisons but had mom dead, free, didn't know what to do, climbed up in the tree, scared, and then she expired from a nerve agent. And that's what we found. And that's literally like on the edge of Sequoia National Park, not, not far from the Central Valley. Um, we see that in almost every other grow. So that's what really gets everybody pissed off. You know, legal growers that are environmentalists, animal rights groups that don't like hunting, but then the conservation groups get together and it doesn't matter where you sit on the hunt, don't hunt, preserve, conserve, that's horrible. No one, and that's where we bring everybody together again and I get unity and we fight this fight together and we start to become a team. Um, that's the one good thing about this thing. When you start mentioning the environment, and animals, everyone gets nonpartisan real quick. They really do. So, any other questions? I think we have a so, question. I want to ask a question about jurisdiction with tribal lands. Does your okay. old department have jurisdiction on tribal lands? Only? And, and no, you can buy damn near anything on them. Yeah. Um, That's a great I question. I know the magic mushrooms are like recognized as a religious thing, but yeah. is, is marijuana under that at all? Or, or, uh, the, the, we don't have jurisdiction per se, but the tribes are working really effectively with us of bringing our teams in to help them with the issue, especially with cartel stuff. Um, but basically, we have to be invited to come on board, and we won't just go work a tribe without their sanctioning. Yep. Uh, I've got two questions. All right. um, how do you know where to look? Do you have <laughs> intelligence, or the dogs sniffing, or are you just canvassing any south-facing slope? And um, how do you think the law should be changed? Well, first, que both great questions, thank you. Um, first off, we, we generally look for that uh, an annual stream that you know is gonna be out there most of the year, south-facing slopes, fairly easy access, um, anywhere on public land, we're gonna look for. We have historical areas that just over 30, 40 years of cartels in California where they tend to try, you know, they'll, they'll go back repeatedly if they haven't had a lot of enforcement pressure. Uh, Google Earth, aerial overflights, technology has gotten great with satellites where we can see trends. We can see terracing from old grows. We can see new grows being started. We found more grows in the last two or three years from just really good work on satellite imagery from big computer screens. Um, and our guys, we've just gotten really good at seeing it from the helicopter, from the planes. Is it a color uh, thing? I've, I've told, I'm told you can tell the color difference. Or? Yeah, it, it, it's got a very unique shade of an emerald green, it, and it, it really radiates really vividly um, when sunlight hits it. Um, and the other thing is, is the way stuff is terraced. Even under heavy canopy, at certain parts of the year, we can see how plants have been terraced and just different changes that don't look natural. Even if you're not seeing a plant, there's a 50-50 chance it's gonna be a growth site the next season. And we've been really effective in finding it that way. And adventurers, hunters, anglers, hikers are 70-80% of turning these things in because they find an old growth site that's not active or they find one that is active, or it's about to be active, where stuff's been started, but nobody's in it maybe, or they didn't run across people. And we get hundreds of those calls every year. So yeah, kind of a mix of the both. And when you said, and the other question on the law being changed, absolutely you have to get heavy penalties on unregulated cannabis farmers, or it's private land or public land. Anything trespass grow, it has to be hammered like you know a, 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 a major crime and bring in, and we're starting to do this now, water stealing, water pollution, use of firearms, any of those possessions. Those EPA banned poisons are actually in the California Penal Code as a felony. If you have carbofuran or metafos imported from Mexico that you can't use in this country in possession, you haven't even put it on a plant yet or in a waterway, it's a felony. And we need to keep pushing those and then have our prosecutors and our environmental crime experts within these teams pushing those prosecutions and not just taking plants and getting fines, but going for bigger penalties, whether it be seizing assets, possibly property. Um, it's the only thing that is gonna, that will seem to stop the really hardcore offenders that are just kind of laughing at the law as it sits now. And I'm not into over, you know, being overzealous on law enforcement efforts ever, but there's a certain point where the public safety and overall the environmental impacts that are affecting not only what they're stealing on their site, 
but what it's doing to the underground aquifer, what it's doing downstream, what it's doing to the wildlife, drinking water for some communities, especially tribal lands that have been hammered by these guys, hence their good relationship bringing us in. I think that's what needs to happen. It would be a start. Okay, I think uh, I think we had. I'd like to put a uh, round of applause. Hey guys, for, I'll be. Um, hmm? I will be at the book table back here. If anyone wants books or blades, and uh, to answer more questions as we fade out, as long as we can stay. I was okay. going to make that announcement. Oh, oh sorry, Steve. <laughs> Never mind. I don't want to cut anybody off if they had a question. So. John, thank you so yeah. much for joining us today. Appreciate the talk and for answering all of our questions. Uh, look forward to chatting with you at the uh, at the booth you have set up in the back. Absolutely, thanks, Grant. Thanks, Steve. Thanks everybody for having me. What a what a fantastic group, and, th and thanks for hosting us. This has been fantastic.